In this video, we're going to look at immigration surplus. In this model, we're going to assume that domestic or native workers are perfect substitutes with immigrant workers. They're both equally productive, equally capable, equally skilled. The supply of labor is going to be perfectly inelastic, so it just simplifies things a little bit for us. The supply of domestic labor is perfectly inelastic at 100. So L subscript SD, supply of domestic labor, equals 100. And we'll also assume that the supply of immigrant labor is perfectly inelastic and also at 100. Okay, uh, just They don't have to be the same. In general, the supply of immigrant labor will be smaller, but keep it at a nice round number here. Uh, the demand for labor is given by 300 minus 5W, where W is the wage. F remember, firms demand labor. And so let's, uh, again, we're trying to find the immigration surplus. So to do that, we're going to first get the equilibrium with no immigrants in the labor market. So setting the labor demand equal to the domestic labor supply. 300 minus 5W equals 100. Subtracting 100 from both sides and then dividing through by 5, the equilibrium wage is $40, and there are 100 domestic workers employed. Moving on to the situation with immigrants. So uh, the immigrant uh, equilibrium will occur where the uh, quantity of labor demanded equals the quantity of labor supplied. So the only thing different here is on the right-hand side, we're going to have 200. Okay, so the supply of labor is perfectly inelastic at 200. Uh, subtracting this 200 from both sides and then dividing through by 5, the equilibrium wage is lower. It is now $20, and there are 200 people employed, 100 domestic workers and 100 immigrant workers. Here's the situation uh, graphically, downward sloping labor demand curve. Without immigration, the supply of domestic workers, which is fixed at 100, intersects demand right here at a wage of $40. So here's our equilibrium point A without immigrants. When immigrants come to this country, the supply of labor will shift to the right by 100. So the supply of labor with domestic and immigrant workers is now 200. We found the equilibrium to occur at a wage of $20. Okay, uh, the final step is to talk about this concept called uh, immigration surplus. So here we have domestic income. We're going to look at that, going to calculate that with and without immigration. We're going to look at employer surplus or producer surplus in the labor market with and without immigration. And then the final thing here is U.S. national income, which is just going to be the sum of uh, domestic worker income and the employer's income or employer surplus. So let's start up here. Uh, domestic income, the amount of income that workers get without immigration is going to be area B and C. Okay, this big rectangle, just B and C. And if we wanted to, we could calculate the value as 40 times 100. Okay, so 40 times 100 or area B and C is the amount of labor income to domestic workers. Employer surplus without immigration is going to be the difference between the height of the labor demand curve and the wage. Uh, remember the height of the labor demand curve represents the marginal revenue product or the value of the marginal product of workers. Okay, This is how much additional revenue a firm will get by hiring one more worker. And so the employer surplus or Income, in this case, generated from hiring workers is just this difference between the height of the demand curve and the wage up to the last worker hired. So that's area A. And that's just an area of a triangle. If we wanted to, we could calculate the area of a triangle as one-half base times height. It would be, uh, this is 20 multiplied by 100 and then, divided th and then divided through by 2 to calculate this area. So U.S. national income is just A plus B plus C. Okay, moving to the situation with immigrants, the wage falls to $20, and now uh, at a wage of $20 and 100 domestic workers, domestic workers get an income equal to area C, or 20 times 100. 
So domestic income, the amount of income going to workers falls in the face of immigration, and we're labeling that as area C. The change here, the loss in income is minus B. So domestic workers' income falls by area B. Employer surplus, the difference between the height of the demand curve up to the market wage, all the way over to the last worker hired, we now have area A, B, and D representing employer surplus or producer surplus. So total U.S. national income now is slightly higher. Um, how much is it higher by? By area D. Area D will represent the increase in income, increase in, in this case, say U.S. national income as a result of immigration. So workers lose employers gain, and notice the gain to employers outweighs the loss to workers. This minus B gets pocketed by employers, uh, so that's a wash, and then you're just left with area D. Again, area D is immigration surplus. So summing up here, area D is the increase in national income to U.S. residents resulting from immigration, or the so-called immigration surplus. Uh, area E, which I didn't highlight earlier, would represent Im immigrant income, okay? And overall, the benefit to employers uh, is greater than the loss to domestic workers. So the benefit to employers is they gain B plus D due to immigration. Uh, uh, workers lose area B, so overall, there is a positive effect here. Uh, this immigration surplus could be understated for one of two reasons. One, and I'll look into this in another video, if native workers or domestic workers complement immig immigrant workers, that could lead to increased productivity and higher wages for domestic workers. And then another thing to keep in mind here, um, given that there's an influx of workers here and falling wages, this might incentivize firms to invest in more capital in areas that have a larger influx of immigrants coming in. So this increased capital will lead to higher productivity, more business formation, and higher wages overall for domestic workers. Okay, I will stop here then. I hope you found this helpful.